Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio Andreoni. I'm an associate professor here and of research at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And I'm also convening this series. So welcome wherever you are. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, this is part of our research seminar series. And tonight we are extremely pleased to have uh, with us uh, Professor Dan Bradsnitz to present uh, his book, Innovation in Real Places. I think you can already uh, see the very nice cover uh, of the book there. Um, let me just uh, remind uh, how do we run uh, this seminar for those who have joined for the first time. Uh, we are going to have uh, around 30 minutes or so presentation by uh, Professor uh, Breitznitz, which will be followed by a uh, discussion uh, with uh, Adria uh, Ruiz Rodriguez, who is one of our PhD students at uh, IPP. Um, and then we will be opening the floor for uh, the audience to engage with Dan, and uh, I will uh, promote you to the panel so that you could you would be able to uh, raise directly uh, your questions. So uh, feel free to use the chat if you would like to start putting down some questions and or raise your hand to uh, to do that. Uh, before we start, uh, I think uh, Professor Bradsnitz is very well known, especially among uh, many of us working, of course, in innovation studies, innovation policy, but a few words uh, uh, before uh, I uh, give the floor to him. Um, uh, Professor Dan Bradsnitz is uh, MOOC Chair of Innovation Studies at the MOOC School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Uh, before uh, uh, being uh, in, uh, at, at uh, the University of Toronto, he's been for several years at uh, uh, Georgia Institute of Technologies. And he was also uh, an active uh, uh, entrepreneur as a CEO of a software company in Israel, has been involved in several commission and in several uh, government initiatives, uh, which have been looking at uh, how to govern and to drive and to change real places. So his book is very much uh, not just the experience of uh, an accomplished academic, but also someone who has been getting his hands dirty on the ground, which is what uh, really, I think, makes this discussion tonight extremely exciting. So thanks again, Dan, for uh, accepting our invitation. We look forward uh, to have this discussion. There are lots of several people already, over 40 people in the room. So again, I invite people to uh, put your question and let's try to use our time as best as possible to give everyone the chance to engage with, with Dan later on. Um, I will introduce Adria immediately after uh, when we will move to the discussion. Thanks again, Dan, the floor is yours. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having me in. I would have much preferred doing it in London, but such is life and such is COVID and such is the new world we're in. <clears throat> what I'm going to do today, uh, as Antonio has asked me, is to present the whole book in uh, less than 30 minutes. So this will be uh, this will be short and to the point. And if you have questions of other part of a book or anything else that I haven't presented, feel free. Um, I'm now in a sort of strange mode of mind because, as Antonio said, I've been uh, involved and I'm now officially the Clifford Clark economist of the Federal Department of Finance of Canada. And we have just announced we're creating a new innovation agency. So uh, I'm now actually puzzling and questioning my own work to see if it actually make any sense when somebody sometimes suddenly say, hey, uh, okay, we read your book now, can you do something about this? So let's start. Um, if my computer would actually agree. Oh, so I think the first and important, most important things that we have to do, uh, both as a policymakers or, or educated public, which is interested, but especially actually academics that care about innovation, is before we do anything, stop and say, okay, what is innovation? Remind us of what it actually is. And also why should we care about it? And I would argue that it has become increasingly important to do that because of various overhyped myths. And the one thing that I want to do, and, and I, I wanted to do in that book, is to remind all of us uh, that innovation is not invention. And it is not only high-tech or new high-tech gadget. Innovation is a proposal action, so the act of actually putting ideas. If invention is a coming up with a new idea, innovation is the putting ideas 
uh, so we can offer new and improved goods, products, and services. And it accomplishes the complete process of taking a new idea on devising new and improved products and services in all stages from the first vision, which everybody is now completely obsessive, but actually also to the design, development, production, sell, users, and after sales of products and services. And even more importantly, it is impactful because it's continuous, not because it is breakthrough. And what we do now is an example. Um, when COVID hit, suddenly all of us moved to Zoom and we were more or less being able to, especially in our industry, to work almost as usual. Our kids went to school, all of this is wonderful, and we no longer even think about Zoom or Teams or Google as something unique. Um, the reason is that of, of this continuous of innovation. Um, tell uh, or, or, or let's just think for a moment, if we had to do this event 15 years ago, we were all avoided like the plague. Antonio and I will have to go to special, really expensive rooms. Uh, it will be unbelievably bad. And, uh, and God only knows how many people could actually see it. Now, it's like the light. We just open, click, and it's there. And the reason, not because somebody invented this technology 20 or 30 years ago, but because every year since that invention, Millions of engineering hours went into improving everything behind that technology, from data communication to uh, uh, data processing, to software algorithms, to the CPUs, to everything that now we don't even think about it. And because it reached that stage that we don't even think about it, it really impacted the world after COVID. But somehow we constantly forget that that's where the big impact is, and we constantly focus on the new. The second. Sorry, thing... can I interrupt you for one second? Sometimes your voice goes away, it goes down. So just to make sure that we don't lose a bit of what you're saying. Okay, I will try to talk like this, but it might be that after I just said how Zoom and the modern technology is great, we are reminded why we don't like teleconferencing. But let's see. Um, I think it's also critical to remember who are the only two agents, if you talk about economic impact, but actually innovate in the economy. And those are firms and individuals, which we sometimes call entrepreneurs. The rest, including my beautiful university, at best are enablers. Uh, they can help stimulate, incentivize those agents to actually act. But if we do an innovation policy, if it looks beautifully on paper, but does not change the behavior of firms and individuals, it will have no impact. Because innovation is so important, uh, innovation based, uh, and it's the only way to achieve, I would say, long-term sustained prosperity. Worldwide in the last 30 years, at least a few trillions have been wasted on blindly copying, usually the Silicon Valley model of VC-backed uh, startups, uh, which is almost impossible to imitate. Second, the Silicon Valley model, actually, if you look at the places like Silicon Valley, or we'll talk later about Tel Aviv, where it actually was successful, leads to unbelievably and growing inequality. Uh, which sort of put into question is why do everybody wants to have it there? And then the question is, are there other models? Can you create local growth or local innovation-based growth without sort of flourishing high-tech industry, VCs and all the rest? And can innovation-based growth create local prosperity, not just wealth? And I would argue and have been arguing in that book, in this book, sorry, not that book, that the answer is yes. But in order to understand how, we also have to understand not just innovation, but globalization. And the real new thing that happened with globalization, uh, especially since the 80s, is that we have 
deconstructed, fragmented, whatever you want to call it, the production of both goods and services into discrete stages that happens in different places in the world. And we have completely forgotten about it until it doesn't work because we have COVID or a natural disaster. And what really happened is that activities, not whole industries are spatially clustered. So semiconductors, which is an industry that I like and was one of the first I ever did research on. Um, now everybody knows that we have a problem um, because exactly of our system. So you look at places like Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, Seoul, Korea, uh, Xinjiang, Taiwan, and Shenzhen, China, you will see that all of those places have extremely successful semiconductor industries. More than that, in most of those places, some of the same companies work. However, if you look at what actually happened in each of those stages, they're completely different. In Silicon Valley and Tel Aviv, it's where people come with new ideas to put on silicon. As we now know, Taiwan is the only place in the world that actually know how to put new ideas on silicon. Uh, Korea controls specific, very important niche. So any one of you buy a smartphone, uh, the second highest profits from any smartphone usually go to a Korean company. And Shenzhen is the only place where you take tens of thousands of completely changing components and materials and create new toys that we buy in prices we can actually buy. So completely different innovation. Each one of them, just think about the activities that I talked about, the business models that you need to have them, leads to different distributional outcomes. And excelling in each one necessitates different innovational capacity, different institutional system, and so on and so forth. So there are real choices, and we should be aware that there are real choices when we design innovation policy, which is space, uh, space or place specific. So let me very quickly run you through the stage just to make it slightly less abstract. So the first uh, stage is novelty, and I'm going to use Tel Aviv as a case of good, the bad, and, and just the plainly sad. The list of companies and logos you see on the side, just to show you that Israel works very well in every model of IT or ICT, both hardware and software. And really it's a place where new innovation comes to be. How does that happen? First, let's talk about the good stuff, a miracle. In 68, in the complete civilian industrial sector, you had 886 R&D workers with academic education in the whole industrial sector. Uh, when I go to teach undergrads, in a big university, and I'm sure that's also true at UCL, and I enter a room, some of the room have more people than the entire academic uh, R&D workers in Israel at 68. 78 to 86, this is not a spelling mistake, it's more than 100,000% in less than a decade of inflation. You can see it in the name of a currency. It started as the Israeli lira or pound, uh, moved to the shekel, uh, then Israel ran out of any innovative ideas, so we just called it the new Israeli shekel. All of that in eight years. By 2000, however, IT export already reached 13 billion, which even more importantly means 71% of the national export and 70% of all GDP growth came just for the startup sector by 2000. Since 2000, it's the largest number of high-tech firms on NASDAQ after the US and China. Uh, let me remind you, there's about six point something million Israelis, maybe seven. Uh, and it's the highest R&D intensity in the world. 4% uh, is wrong. I was told that this year it might be five. So everything we ever wanted in innovation-based miracle. Then there's the second part, the left behind us. 68, economic equality was the second most agitarian economy in the greater OECD, basically Western society. 2021, inequality is one of the most unequal rich OECD economies. Uh, to a degree that one of every five families in Israel does not have enough money to buy food at the end of a month. 
So severe inequality. And it is startup nation indeed, meaning that nothing else, if you do an analysis of any of the whole economy and society, nothing else but VC fueled financial exit seeking startups work. Basically, Israel is Silicon Valley on steroids because all the money is also foreign. So when it seeks financial exits and they get them, most of the money does not stay in the local economy. It runs back to usually the US. Um, and yet somehow every city on earth wants, claims that it wants to have this experience. And I'm scratching my head and wondering why. Second stage, and again, I want to show that when we talk about innovation, we should not only talk about high tech. So I'm going to this very small place. If people, I think some of you might know a place called Italia. Uh, it's just above Venice, sort of to the west, Riviera del Brenta. Uh, and that's the place where any, if you ever buy a luxury, and I'm talking about the real luxury shoe, no matter what the name is on the shoe, at some point it visited this small place in Italy. And the reason is that this is the place that know how to take, unlike what you might see in a reality TV show where, you know, you have a designer and they come with a design and then 24 hours later, you have a luxury shoe. That's not how it works. Uh, you actually need to have a design and then somebody has to figure out how this design becomes a shoe that a human can actually wear and not just for 20 minutes. And that shoe, especially if you pay like 3000 euro on, you might expect to handle the fact that you step on it for a day. There's a thing called sweat and chemical reaction and you need to produce it and make money. All of those things happen in Brenta. And even more interestingly, if Israel and other places, it was the state that led this transformation. In Brenta, it was uh, a local entrepreneurs that saw in the 80s and 90s what's happening with globalization, says we cannot stay in mass production and started to create relationship first with Paris and then with Milano and then with New York and brought the local policymakers to start doing it with them. And what is Interesting is if you want to excel in that stage, you need different innovational capacity, of course, different roles for policymakers, completely different education system, uh, as different financial system and local global flows, right? Um, how ideas, how you get into the place where the design is in advance so the designer knows that you have a place to go to, but also so you can prepare your capacity to create things for the design of two, three years from now. So this actually by the way involved more um, additive manufacturing than most industries I've ever seen, just as an aside. And doing that created widespread prosperity and good jobs for a wide array of different skills level, not just, you know, the R&D engineers in Israel or Silicon Valley, and you know, between the two, with, with all of us, not just the two of us, uh, I wouldn't really worry about the graduate of Stanford in computer science. That's not my, my first, as a policymaker, my first worry at night is, oh, how would Brian, who finished a master in computer science in Stanford, would survive this life? No, I would worry about almost everyone else. And this kind of innovation-based model actually creates good jobs for them. Stage through and, and what I call second generation product and component innovation. Welcome to Taiwan. You, I've, I assume, understand the, the bottom picture, which is TSMC, a company that very few know existed until COVID. Now everybody knows they existed. But for me, it's actually more important and more interesting to look at the picture above, which is giant. Uh, giant uh, manufacturing company, uh, which is a company that basically using exactly the same model of a creation of a Taiwanese semiconductor industry. So working with the same public research institution called ITRI, uh, start playing, getting got, and then start playing together 
with what was then a completely new technology called carbon fiber, and then figure out how to use carbon fiber to do something else, which is in this case, bike frames. By so doing, could offer completely different array of bikes or taking bikes like mountain bikes, which Antonio might remember when we were young, you needed to be a semi-professional athlete to even carry the bike to the mountain. Now everybody can carry a mountain bike. Uh, and Giant has become a massive company anchoring a whole industry and a whole set of workers around it. Um, and any one of you who have a Chinese smartphone should thank a company called MediaTek, which create the brains for those smartphones. Um, and by, by the way, again, nobody heard about them because they're second generation innovation, but they ship to the tune of several billion units a year. Um, in order to create that and to focus on that, um, you needed, again, a different innovation, a set of innovation or capacity, completely different roles of policymakers. I just told you of how this public research institution work hand in hand with several companies to take a technology from abroad, diffuse it, figure out what they can do it in a second generation innovation, almost completely different than what you will see in Silicon Valley. You need different education system, different financial system because if your aim is to create TSMC, you need a financial system that every year or two would allow your company to put several billions to 10 to 15 billions in capital equipment investment. If you go to Wall Street and say, this is what, this is my business model, you'll be fired within two minutes. Uh, different local global flows, right? Where exactly do you put yourself and how you tie yourself into the global system? Much widespread prosperity, good jobs for a wide array of different skill set. Again, a different choice. Last but not least, um, Shenzhen, China, which everybody heard about until very recently, everybody thought that this is where there's sweatshops. Uh, but in reality, it's the only place, and I want to remind you all that unlike Beijing or Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen didn't really exist until the late 80s. It was a village. It had no universities. Even today, to call it a hub of high-quality academic research is a joke. And yet, every company that Western companies or government are worried about, from Huawei to ZTE to Tencent to GDI, if you look at the uh, drones, uh, to BYD, all of them actually come from the area around Shenzhen. And all of them developed their ability to compete in the global system by knowing how to build stuff. Uh, so I know I'm repeating myself, but you need it's important to remember, if that's what you want to do, you need different innovation capacity, completely different rules for policymakers, different education system, financial system, local global source. And again, the other thing about Shenzhen, it was a poor fishing village, mostly if I remember correctly, of the Hakka Chinese, which are the equivalent to the traveling people. Now it is the most prosperous and one of the biggest and definitely the richest cities in China. I'm going to change talk for a moment because I want to at least open up a discussion about what is the difference between innovation and industrial policy. And I want to remind us all that there's one of the most important things is a different policy logic. So if I look at, at the classic industrial uh, policy, Japan and South Korea, I know exactly what are the markets and the products, cars or ships, for example. I know exactly how to buy and sell them. And then I can use, it. we used to call it strategic industrial policy, but really tactical of how viewing that, how do I get in? If we talk about innovation in its pure form, it's undefined markets and products. Sometimes the technology itself is a product, 
So basically you have policy makers, uh, and that's one of my problems that I have now, that you want to uh, equip, create, if you will, agents, companies, and individuals with the capacity to do something that I don't really know what it's going to do, right? Because if I know what they're going to do, I would leave my uh, temporary position in finance and move to the private market again and become a billionaire. And then I will tweet that I want to put the cocaine back in Coke and everybody would love me again. However, since that's not what I want to do, what I know that as an innovation policymaker, I need to have a commitment to a process of continuous policy experiment. I'm not sure what is going to work. And the ability to kill is as important as the ability to constantly come up with new ideas. For any one of you who understand politics, that means that I'm just killing any political leader that I have above me, unless I can create a buffer. And especially since I need to come with radical ideas, and sometimes we just talked about Taiwan, TSMC, UMC, all those companies did not exist. The, the state actually created them. Um, and I think this is very, very important when we start talking about what does it mean to have an innovation policy and how it is different than industrial policy. And when we do that, I think one of the other more important things that, that I don't find too often when I go to places, real places or not like Silicon Valley, but more seriously, to a lot of places where people really want to do something is they don't have a vision. And when I mean a vision here, I'm not talking about huge grand vision, but a very pragmatic vision. Let's assume, you know, that we are in Birmingham and we start a process of policy making and we are really successful. How does Birmingham look 15 years from now? Uh, what kind of companies, what maybe kind of industries, what is it that Birmingham companies will give the global supply chain? What do they need in order to have? Who will be employed? And by the way, why is that a good vision for all Birminghamians? Once we have that, we can start to develop using innovation policy as one tool, develop a way to bring us there basically reverse engineering. Instead, too many times you go, and in the EU, I'm sorry to say, it has become too often, you go to places that they develop an innovation policy just because somebody told them it's a great idea, or they, they really think it's, it's, they must be innovative, but they basically think about it as, we need more VCs and a lot of patents. And, and that's, to me, is, is you take, a, as I say, because innovation policy, you constantly need to experiment. You go into a very rough sea with no map and no idea of where you want to be. And then you're completely shocked that you are completely lost. Um, and I think that's something we keep on not doing very well. Uh, and as we do that, we have to remember the four fundamentals. Uh, we have to remember how we think about the flows of local global knowledge, demand and input and how we actually institutionalize them. Not everybody in the world would immediately want to go to Birmingham because a few people in Birmingham have a great idea or great technology. It needs to be institutionalized. We need to figure out the supply and creation of public and semi-public goods. We need to create a local ecosystem that reinforms firm level benefits. So if your aim is to look like Taiwan or like Germany, uh, investing $3 billion in creating a vibrant VC industry is, is it's just the wrong tool. And too often, even in, in civilized places like Canada, that's what happened. You, instead of developing a local ecosystem that actually reinforce the freedom level benefits that you want, you go after the latest fashion. And we have to remember that this is, you know, as evolutionary economists, I always will claim that you have to take evolution seriously. But in this case, 
it, it, we have to in innovation because you have to understand how the previous free fundamentals and the role of public policy change. For example, let's go back to Israel. What the office of what was then called the Office of Chief Scientist did in order to start the industry in the 70s when there was nothing is completely different than what the role of a Office of Chief Scientist, now the Israel Innovation Authority, should have when Israel is over 20 years at 5% of, uh, of GDP bar, the business investment in R&D, which is the highest in the world. If they will stay with the same program and say approach, they're either irrelevant or actually interfere with the growth of a local industry. And we keep forgetting doing that. Uh, with that, I'll stop. I hope I didn't talk for too long and I will uh, let Adria move you and I will also stop sharing if I can. Thanks, Dan. That's, that's great. And I, uh, I think we will have an interesting exchange later also on semantics because what you described in the context of Europe has been called innovation policy is a way to uh, fight it back against industrial policy, which was actually in different ways declined more in line with what you described and, you know, the emphasis on the full cycle of innovation, production, manufacturing capabilities and all of that. Um, we have Adria, uh, who is uh, Rodriguez, who is one of our PhD students, who is doing very interesting work around uh, green transition and talking about brown to green and continuity in innovation. Adria, you have eight, 10 minutes, uh, and then we open the floor. Let me just remind everyone, we re re all these um, events are recorded, so you can watch them uh, in uh, uh, the YouTube channel later. Uh, and also that there is a chat function. Uh, Patricia has already uh, posted the question. We will collect all of them after for the Q&A part. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Antonio. And thanks, Anne, for the brilliant presentation as well as the book. I enjoyed it um, very much and it certainly um, shows your impressive uh, expertise and amount of both breadth and depth of the arguments as well as the cases. And I think it certainly conveys a, a, a compelling um, story and an argument. My comments emerge more maybe out of a, looking at the linkages between your arguments as well as the cases. So I've been trying to, you know, think as you mentioned in the book about regions I'm interested in and so on and, and see how that would apply. And I've structured this in like three main areas, but of course I'm just going to throw in comments, questions, and pick um, whichever you ones you think are most interesting or, or more relevant. Um, so the first one is on the, the the idea on local prosperity. So I think um, this is a core or a fundamental um, theme that runs across the book. It's the prime motivation of why different regions should be thinking about different types of innovation models. And you illustrate this by criticizing um, the Silicon Valley mode in California, for instance, by arguing that it creates inequalities you have mentioned in the presentation because of biased skills demand against a few occupations around engineers, a few, a few sectors and so on. And I mean, well, it is true that I was just checking the, the data, so take it with a pinch of salt, I just, I was curious. Um, that California indeed is more unequal, has higher poverty rates, higher unemployment, unemployment rates um, than the US average. And, and, and a lot of within regional um, inequality. And the difference is not that that high, right? So it's about one percentage point, maybe two percentage points. So someone could argue that indeed there are maybe more fundamental structural causes to why inequality persists. And I was wondering if, if, if you have explored maybe in, in, in other um, research or other work that you've been doing or that you may want to do, I mean, to maybe substantiating a bit more the claim of, of different innovation models bringing reducing inequality by maybe thinking, um, I don't know what will, you, will be your answer about, you know, what other forms of change or institutional change would be needed so that both you have an innovative, a pro proper innovation model that at the same time reduces um, inequality. And this is also related to the idea of um, job creation in the sense that I find that in a lot of the scholars, when I read the literature, I mean, including ourselves, uh, including myself, when we discuss about um, prosperity, we assume that the creation of jobs uh, equates the creation of decent jobs, right? So looking at the ILO definition, for instance, we're talking about, you know, decent pay, rights at work, occupational safety and health and so on. But we don't really go into the, into the, 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 the political economy dynamics that are involved in not just 
creating a job, but in fact, making sure that the job is at the very minimum decent. So in a sense, you could have a factory in California, but it might have lower working um, sort of standards than a factory in Germany, right? Um, so I also wonder if you see, you know, lo local players, um, local leaders playing an important role in this area, or if this is something that you, that you have explored. The other area is more related to the policy design and implementation of innovation policies. So, um, and particularly the idea that government, governance systems are multi-layered. So, um, again, I looked at the region at Europe, and as you know, in Europe, we have supranational innovation policies at the EU level, national policies, and then regional policies, and even sometimes city, city policies, right? And in your examples, you combine um, policies or action at the central state level. So for instance, the creation of ITRI in Taiwan or the special economic zone in, Ch in Shenzhen with action at the local level, which you clearly identify. Um, so for instance, the specialized skills programs in Riviera del Brenta. Um, this shows that there is there needs to be some sort of coordination right, between different multi-layered governance system. And I'm not sure this is something that is developed in depth. And I was wondering if assuming that there needs to be coordination and alignment, if just to, if there is a maybe a minimum sort of policy space that region should have in order to implement innovation policies that contribute to create the necessary innovative uh, innovation capabilities or to put forth a different innovation model so what is the policy space of region and, and, and if that is sort of optimal do i still have time antonio um and the last yeah just um the last one um was maybe on the direction of the ecosystem. So I think much of the, the, the work that runs through the, or the arguments that run through the book is about creating innovation, um, ecosystem, capabilities, and, and so on. Um, and I don't know if, if this is beyond the scope, I maybe here is where it comes in the discussion that you have opened on industrial policy and innovation policy. But in the context where we are with uh, a potential environmental breakdown in you know, 10, 20 years reaching these tipping points. Um, I wonder whether innovation policy, in the way you define it, can be used as a tool to direct ecosystems towards a particular green um, direction. And I'm not defining green here. I think we could go on into <laughs> discussions about what does it mean, but I hope that more or less the, the idea is clear. No, what would be the role of innovation policy? Is it desirable? Is it possible that, 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 there is a, that it gives a direction to the ecosystem? Um, and yeah, I think um, you illustrate this, for instance, in the case of Taiwan with E3 that you have mentioned that in a way sets a sort of direction when it goes into specific technology. So I was just thinking about what is the role of innovation policy, ecosystem direction and the green transition. And yeah, I have more uh, questions, but I think I'll shut up now <laughs> and I we will, will shut you up. Uh, yes. share the space with other people. <laughs> Not the kind Thank of very much, question man. we would have had if we were having a drink after. Uh, uh, Dan, I think you have already quite a, a, a bunch of important questions there to, to address. I leave you to decide to pick one or two while I also promote some of the uh, people from the audience to the panel so that while you start uh, addressing some of them, they will be with us for the next round of questions. Up to you to choose what you'd like to start with. Sure. So I will... Um... By the way, I'm apologizing to uh, people who, who write. For me on the screen, it sort of appears and disappears. And if I try to read it, I will not hear what you talk. So I'll read all the comments later. Unless if there's something important, Antonio, Adra, and you want me to, please just, just read it loudly, okay? Yeah. Um, I'll start with the end because I think it will answer some of your questions. Um, and the end was your green tech, okay? So without defining what is green tech, but assuming and agreeing that it's important, I would say that by definition, it is an innovation policy because you are trying to do probably two things at the same time. One, you are trying to create uh, new products and services, but especially new technologies. But the other more important thing, and I'm now much more aware of that as, you know, inside a, a financial, a finance department of a big country, G7, you will have no green transformation if you cannot make 
almost all of your companies, no matter whether it's services or industrial companies, I start to engage with new technologies because by definition, green tech is a new technology. So it's lovely to have startups that create green tech, but if you want to completely change the economy, you need every, everyone, including your banks and you know, small companies, start to engage very deeply with green tech, which turns out to be maybe even more difficult than actually inventing the green tech in the first thing. Um, so it's two different kinds of, um, of innovation policies, if you will. And, and they're not necessarily the same. We can, you and I can sit together and for a specific place or country design the best innovation policy for creating green tech industry, whatever that is, right? We haven't defined it. That does not mean that our country will actually become a leading green economy if we don't figure out diffusion. Uh, and I don't think, by the way, as an aside, not the book, but now being involved in the policy, we are doing a horrible job of dealing with the second. We are obsessed about the first completely. Somehow, we I don't know, we think it's magic. You know, the new technology will arrive. will be better and greener. And apart from things that we do with carbon, right, basically like the tax system for R&D, but that way or limitation, we sort of assume that diffusion will happen and will happen rapidly enough. Now, in terms of regions, and, and I can use it a little bit. Um, and let me give you an example. I don't know how many of you know Canada, but Canada has a very big, until very recently, very rich province called Alberta. Alberta's main uh, exports is fuel uh, produced by, we have to admit it, one of the most polluting ways possible because it's, it's basically oil sands. By the way, if you like innovation policy, the whole technology, I mean, they claim that this is the private sector, but you actually look at the history of technology, it was a big public research project that develop the technologies that allow you know the utilization of oil sands to actually produce oil now alberta understand that green tech is coming and they really want to be a player in hydrogen blue hydrogen green hydrogen and they might be but the problem now then begins that if you actually want to have prosperity for all Albertian to even compare, forget compete with what the oil industry does. It is not enough that you just produce the hydrogen and sell it or store it. You need to develop capacities all around hydrogen. For example, if you want to use hydrogen, you need to retrofit almost all your old energy system. Uh, I have seen a jet engine that melted when there was an experiment using hydrogen because it's different temperature and all. It's not rocket science. It's what I will call second or third innovation, but you need to develop that. And it might not be in the billion, but it will be hundreds of million because you will retrofit the whole world and you'll create an industry that employ the people that are not going to be employed by oil and are not R&D engineers. It is not clear in the context of Canada who exactly has a capacity to develop that kind of vision and then empower it. It is very clear that you need to have people in Alberta and there are some to think about and then lead it, but without a federal push, what you call supernatural push, and maybe even chipping in, at least in the beginning, I don't think that will happen. Um, so to answer to your second question, I will say it that way, without local leaders, and they don't have to be from the government, but local leaders who can envision the vision, create, what you call coordination and a coalition of the willing, if you will, to use a horrible idiom, 
it's not enough. But without an ability to then play with the national and in ultra national institutions and create a space, there's only so much you can do. And, and that's the problem. So I didn't go deeply into that in the book, but remember is a third, uh, sorry, the last part of a book where I give as an example, three things that are crucial for local innovation-based development. And there's almost zero that a local leader can do in order to influence them. Thanks, Dan. I think, I think you already brought in lots of more meat into that discussion. And I would like to give the chance to a couple of people from the audience, starting with Luke and then Anesu, uh, to raise their question. And I will read also Patricia's question, who has a kid with her, so she uh, uh, preferred to just me reading the, the question. Uh, Luke, would you like to start? And let's try to keep it short so that then can, we can do several rounds. There are other people as well who seem to be keen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for your presentation, uh, Dan. Uh, my question is uh, very straightforward. Uh, the geography of innovation policy making invariably suffers from jurisdictional confusion, local versus regional versus national. Uh, can you share some observations on this issue based on your own research? Thanks, Luke. That was sharp and direct. Fantastic. Anesu, would you like to, to go after? And then we give a chance to then after I read Patricia. Fantastic. I uh, thank you very much, Dan, for your presentation. I mean, my question really is, uh, I work in a local authority and one of the things we're looking to do is set up an innovation fund. And the challenge we face is exactly as you've said, there are people within our local authority who think of innovation as a very high tech, sexy stuff. And diffusion of innovation is kind of seen as like, well, really that's not innovation. So that's one challenge we're trying to get over. But I'm interested following your presentation to understand a bit more about in a context where there's a uh, economic globalization, how can I as a policymaker add value where I have a business base that's very diverse, big companies in, in healthcare, automotive, but also SMEs. Am I as a policymaker to be understanding these global flows or because I would imagine that businesses are the ones who are very much have the understanding being there at the core face of this activity. So how do I work with the business space to get this understanding? Uh, because we've got very limited resources, it's a very small team, so we can't really cover everything. So help you to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. And let me just read Patricia's uh, question. It's a long one, it's a comment. She says, uh, I wonder if innovation is a, a purposeful action to transform inventions into gadgets to be consumed by citizens then not only firms are important agents, but also the innovative state interested in offering citizens new social solution to complex social problems and academics questioning whether social problems will be really mitigated with that gadget without causing more social inequalities. It's a complex, long question, but hopefully we got there. Uh, and uh, also from Latin America, uh, questions around strategy for prosperity, example for Latin America, any suggestion? Simple question. <laughs> Simple, yeah. I can answer each one of them in, in less than 20 seconds. Um, let me start with the almost last one. Uh, and that is about the state and all the rest. I want to be very precise in what I said, okay? I didn't say that universities and governments and all the rest are, are not important. However, again, and in this case, we're speaking about economic innovation, let's call it technological economic innovation, right? If companies and entrepreneurs would not at some point take those ideas produced by the research and all the rest and take into the account the academic, when they do action, it's great, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you have great ideas, and that's a problem I now face in Canada, um, Canada is maybe one of the best, not maybe, is one of the best in inventing new ideas from uh, everything that has to do with uh, artificial, the current thing that we call artificial intelligence, <clears throat> deep learning was invented in Canada because Canada policymakers and the business sector are so bad in actual innovation, all the implication of that in terms of creating of new companies, jobs, decisions, how to use this technology morally or immorally are no longer in Canada. All the IPR is owned by 
mostly American and a few Chinese companies. They create the jobs, they create the money, they create the profit, they decide what are the rules of the game. And I can tell you that as Canadian, we probably would have chosen something else. So while all of this is important, if you forget that in the end, in an economy, and, and whether we like it or not, we all live in a capitalist economies. If it doesn't go into the marketplace, meaning companies and individuals need to do something with it, you won't have your impact. And that's what I meant, that we have to remember those two agents of innovation, not that the others are not important. But at some point, if they don't act, you won't have innovation. By now, I'm, I'm almost forgetting, but I will try to remember. So I'll start with, look, um, yes, there's a lot of problems um, between jurisdiction. Um, and I think the jurisdiction that understand that and, and figure this out in different ways uh, from Taiwan, speaking about the jurisdiction that has some diplomatic issues, uh, to Israel, to Riviera de Brenta, and figure out how they can change the rules, but how they can act with those rules, sometimes very strategically. If you look at what both Israel and Taiwan has done, you'll have a problem. Uh, however, as policymakers, and again, I'm going to, instead of harping on the EU, which seems to be a hobby in Europe, I will harp on the Canadian government, which seems to have the same thing. I found it one of the best uh, uh, answers to why we don't have more Canadian Blackberry or Shopify or even green tech is exactly in this problem. It is much easier for a Canadian company to sell to the whole of the United States than to get regulatory approval to sell to all the provinces of Canada. So if I'm a Canadian, most most Canadians solve this problem by saying, oh, and just moving to the United States when they open their company. And that might happen to a lot of jurisdictions that don't figure out how we can enable entrepreneurs and companies to actually operate where they are. Uh, and so, um, so one thing I want to, to, to sort of, um, maybe I put a myth that, that all the examples I gave, the Taiwanese knew how the global economy would look like when they started to play with semiconductors in the 80s. And the answer is complete no. And if any Taiwanese tell you that it's correct, then she's lying through her teeth. What they did understand, and I think that's exactly what you described, they understood their limitation. And I'm using Taiwan on a purpose. We can use Israel in a different way. They understood that A, uh, they don't have a capital to play what the Japanese and the Korean have played at the time, which basically like putting down tens of billions a year in constantly improving technologies in very specific niches of semiconductors, basically hoping to get all the other bankrupt. Uh, if you read the history, it's called the uh, uh, semiconductor wars. Um, they also, for political reasons, did not want, and that's the lesson that the KMT that controlled Taiwan at the time, did not want competing center of power. They did not want the Kairatsu or uh, the Chobo. They were afraid. They thought that that leads to uh, corruption and systemic women. Sorry, we lost Dan. Huge amount of money. Dan, sorry, we lost you. Sorry, we lost you for 10 seconds. Uh, so your, what was voice the last drop, thing? your voice drop is getting, is getting a bit worse. Um, they didn't like Arezzo and the idea of Chabels and then everything. Yes, okay. So, so they basically envisioned uh, uh, a 
an area, meaning Taiwan, where you have a lot of semiconductor companies that can play in a lot of niches, cannot compete with Silicon Valley. They didn't think that they're good enough. So second stage. And a few big companies. So he said, we have to make two solutions. One, we have to diffuse the capability to play. Back then it was called ISIC, application specific IC. And we have to solve the problem because that's where there's a huge capital investment of how you produce them. By solving those two, they also completely change a global industry. But they understood where they are, not what will be the final solution, but where are they in both domestic and international limitation? And what does make sense for them when they had very few resources to concentrate? So, to put it into perspective, what I mean by very few resources, TS, both UMC and TSMC's total investment was about 25 million per each, which is quite a few. Uh, do you want me, Antonio, to try to do, uh, let me think about Latin America while you uh, maybe- Good, yes, let's see if there something. are other questions coming along the way. Um, I don't see any at the moment. Um, so I, I, I can tell you what, what, what I, I, well, my problem with Latin America is that I have tried to start research to actually answer this question. And it was very interesting. And then COVID happened. So for the last three years, I couldn't actually travel to do any of the field work. So what I could tell you uh, that was very interesting for me was, and again, it's before COVID, uh, figuring out um, more or and more diffused or diffused, enlarged uh, attempts to do what Corfu did in Chile, for example, with the salmon industry, the mining industry, to a certain degree, the wine industry. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm mentioning those industries because those industries also create jobs for people who are not just R&D engineers. Um, Panama, again, before COVID, had a very interesting approach which we have not implemented yet, but a very interesting approach. And the reason, because it's, I think also relates to Ansu's question. They said, okay, we are very small. Uh, we are not have a lot of resources, but what we do have, and, and our university system is not good enough to really compete and become a Silicon Valley. What we do have is a massive logistical base and very good, um, understanding also of global finance and some logistics. So Copa Airlines, if any one of you from Latin America is aware. Let's develop innovation in industries that are around this. For example, what they thought about was software. So not anything that shutter the earth, but around those industries where we're already good at, tailorized to Latin America, and then after we showcase it, pilot it in Panama, try to export it. Because right now we, 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 we have almost nothing in software. And, and that I think was a very, very interesting approach which can work. So the first thing they identify is what they might be really good and excel at global, globally. And then said, how you develop innovations around it, sort of diffuse it to other industries or put industries that actually can then also strengthen your core strength. Again, uh, just as they were about to try the pilot, COVID hit. So, uh, and I don't know now, to be very honest, uh, it's an open question whether they will actually do that pilot because the minister of innovation change, the prime minister change, the minister of finance change. But I know that it was a very interesting exercise. Um, I'll stop here.
uh, and, and let there is, other... there is one other question. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Which is about uh, what do you think about frugal innovation should get more attention from Western public policy? From uh, Wei Zhang Wang. So I, I will say that at some point, uh, as you probably know, Antonio, uh, there was no innovation course taught in a Western university which didn't devote at least a third of it to frugal innovation. So I think it's actually got a huge amount of attention uh, when it was very, very fashionable. And it was very, very fashionable when India seems to be becoming the next China. And when India did not become the next China, it went down the hill. I still think it's important. Um, I think, I do think that some of it is already in. I think it should teach us all the lessons but not as not the book and everything, but as an innovation scholar, that we we are sinful in constantly running after new trends. If you want me to be fully cynical, I think that part of it is that too many of us, and I was one, <laughs> work in business schools, and in business schools you always have to offer a product to somebody who's paying God, I mean, way too much money in order to come in be taught by us and when you do that you constantly need to you know show that you're innovative so frugal innovation was there for five years now it's something else now it's something else and i don't think that's a very good way of devising national or regional innovation policy thanks thanks that's that's great uh i don't see other question coming um anyone would like to I don't see any raised hand or anything in the chat. Oh, wait one second. No. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I'm missing some. Uh, Valeria Bastos, let me promote you so you can ask the question directly. Here we are. Sorry. And Anes, I think, has a follow up question. Valeria, and then Anes for the follow up. Valeria, you can unmute yourself and raise your question anytime. Okay, uh, I'll read the question for you. It seems that uh, she says, I would uh, really like to know what do you think of the prematurely deindustrialized Brazilian economy and what paths can we take? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? And the second one is uh, from Anesu. Uh, let me read it quickly so that uh, we have a bit more time for the answer. How is it, how easy is for developing countries, Southeast Asia, Africa, etc to tap into a globalized economic context where strengths are very much entrenched. So we go back to our GVC. Yeah, so so I, I, I will start with a second. Um, and, 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 and it's actually, I'm optimistic to a degree. And I'll explain. Uh, first, because of globalization, we have much more opening than in the past. Um, if you just think about the places that now are critical at some point of the production system of both goods and services, today to what they were like 40, 50 years ago, it's impressive how many, how many more places have become important and how they're not only, only, it's not optimal, but only in you know, the classical old places. Um, second, as we all know, and we should not uh, forget, between COVID, natural disaster, and realization that we really don't have a fully global system, but especially in the uh, production of goods, it's a China region-based system in critical point. Add to that the fact that we have geopolitics, which we should not forget. I mean, if anyone forget, you in Europe should just look east. There is an attempt to restructure the global production networks. Uh, my belief, right? You cannot do science, social science on the future, but my belief is that what will really happen is that we'll have complementary regional production networks because the, the logic, of how, why you fragmented stuff actually makes sense. 
the logic of why putting it only in one place on earth makes zero sense. It was more politics and money. Um, it is now understood. So we'll probably have a few regional systems together with a global one. I mean, that's an optimal. That's when I'm op optimist. If I'm pessimist, we'll have two systems, one around China, one around the US. Um, but if I'm optimist, that's the case. What does that mean is that by definition, there's now opening for places who can be active. It does not mean that somebody will come and say, oh, please, yeah, sure. But it does mean that in the past, if you had to work extremely hard, if you're not what you called entrenched and rightly so called entrenched place, now it's not that it's easy, but at least there's an opening. It, and I think for about the next five years. But if those places don't come up with their they wouldn't take the initiative. Nobody's going to, to give it to them. What we can do is help them, the places that try to develop this, with advice, help, support. But we cannot replace local effort. I mean, that has not never worked and never will work. Um, about Brazil. Uh, uh, I love Brazil uh, in some areas and in some uh, points, Brazil constantly show that it is in as an eat, its people and its companies are as innovative as one can be. From oil to aerospace to mining. And that's just the three big things that come. Uh, but I think Brazil has you know, I'm a political economist. I think the main problem of Brazil, or if you want your even more tragic neighbor to the South called Argentina, is the political problem. Um, and I don't know <laughs> how to solve the political pro. I hardly know how to solve a political problem of a very good mannered civilized place like Canada. Uh, I can't even tell you how Brazilian should solve or Argentinian should solve their political problem. What I would say that assuming those are not really solvable in the near future, um, it might very well be that a few regions that can, can get their collective action together would at least improve the life of the residents and be able to become in, more innovative and more fruitful. And, and I'm sorry for being slightly pessimistic. I'm trying to be optimistic, but when when faced with severe political problems, I don't know what the solutions are. May, may I just, uh, given that we don't have other questions, and then, oh, sorry, one second. Let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. Um, just building on what you just said, right? Because I think you are, your book, it's very much a, a player towards, you know, rethinking, as you said, you know, we should ask what innovation is about. And uh, I would say you emphasized uh, a number of dimensions, processes, production, real organization, real capacity to translate things into. And I think this to a certain extent after a sort of uh, drunk period where innovation was what you described like Canada, right? You know, the focus on the patent box or getting patents out or getting everyone was supposed to become a leader in biotechnology in Europe, everyone was supposed to do the same things and so on. So we sort of realized that um, after a financial crisis and now with the pandemic where people realized that the so-called innovative countries were not able to manufacture and scale up things that were much needed, uh, that actually we have missed in innovation and understanding of production organization and sort of we lost you know, that, that kind of. But also you also mentioned in the end, you recognize that uh, there is lots of emphasis about building ecosystems across developing countries and middle-income countries. And uh, the innovation uh, scholarship seems to say, we stop when the political economy problem starts, which seems to me, again, another way of fundamentally forgetting what innovation is about, right? Because as you pointed out, it's not just the, the, the new gadget, the new product, it's, it's, a, it's a social process, a different type of social condition of innovation that had to be met. So I'm, I'm like to... Uh, I know that you share some of this concern to understand from your perspective 
also from a scholar perspective, right? What went wrong and what we should try to promote uh, in terms of developing a scholarship that helps you also people like you are now on the other side of the, of the equation in trying to have meaningful conversations around how to address political economy issues in innovation, how to realign or reconnect innovation production and sort of go away from that sort of very distorted, which actually has affected evolutionary economics as much as uh, other type of branches. So I think there's a big literature and tradition and I mean, work the big like Matt Bass and others have done over the 30, 40 years to go. This was at the core of what innovation was about, right? You know, you, you mentioned the uh, Veneto, but of course for people like me working in Emilia Romagna, that was the place people were going in the seventies and eighties, right? So what went wrong and how do we address this big gap? Because um, my experience is that, and I have now a bit of number of PhD students and young scholars I constantly meet with INET and so on, that story has been lost. <laughs> so I think it's a problem of the business school and us not teaching the right story. So what, what, what should we do? So first I will say um, sometimes crises are helpful. So I can tell you that at least in North America, and I'm, I'm saying North America on purpose because many of my co-offers are now in the uh, National Economic Council of the White House. Uh, you know, the COVID and geopolitics, but especially COVID put a mirror in the face of people. And they said, oh, oops. And at least the United States, Canada being Canada, we're, you know, we lovely, we're good mannered, we like people to like us, and we're very, very slow. So it will happen, but it, in, in the US, and I've already been involved in that, there is a whole new strategy for reconstructing supply networks and where it's critical, where it's not. Realization, and again, I even wrote about it of, of you know, this is, you can't just assume onshoring because you've lost the capabilities. How are you going to either recreate the capabilities or use new technologies so you can create new capabilities and build on them and said, okay, we lost that battle, but let's then change the rules of the game of production, right? Where this is not yet being taught, which is a big problem, is around finance. Uh, and you can see that, especially big finance, uh, because we now have a problem and that is you can create a lot more wealth, and I use the, the more on purpose, and a lot faster by playing finance in order to see that as instead of an industry with allocated resource for productive, right, that's its role, view that as the, in the industry where you make or break things. When you do that, who cares about production? Because production means capital equipment. Capital equipment meant when my return on assets are by definition high, because I have assets. If I get rid of my assets in various accounting problem, I have great re you know, return on uh, assets. And it's go on and on and on and on. Um, in terms of INED and business schools, yeah, we should, one thing that you should do is to create a PhD student and then infect, somehow infect them into those business schools and hope that they will be promoted. Because I don't, I don't expect myself to completely change in the way I by now think and teach. And I definitely not expect my colleagues that earn up to half a million dollars a year to teach what they teach now and don't really want to change the courses to change anything in the next 10 years. Um, what we need to do, and I see it where I am, as the political economy. So I need to be able as a policymaker to offer solutions for ministers to do the right thing without destroying their political career. And when the offer is you need to experiment in a lot, um, significant amount of investment, huge long term um, until you actually see results. So by that time you're home, retired with your grandchildren um, and the ability to create horrific scandals for you and 
it might be, you know, that the policy is wrong and we have to change it. If I want to figure out the machinery of how to build this, what, you know, you and I would call innovation agencies, in a way that buffer the ministers, the politicians, the only thing I can assure you is that no politicians would actually do what needs to be done unless, you know, you, you face an existential crisis. And we do a really bad job at explaining that and then explaining why those structure uh, in the context of Canada and, and England, I think it will be called something like a crown corporation. It might be better than creating a ministry, for example. And it's better not just because you can bring better talent from the business sector, which is true. No, it's a political. The crown corporation can fail and do horrible things and it wouldn't stick to the minister. The Crown Corporation can experiment. It wouldn't stick to the minister if it fails. The second thing, we constantly talk about experimentation and we have very sophisticated things of how to measure and do the experiment that look wonderful on paper. I now want to implement them in the case of innovation policy and, and put the legislation to something that actually work. It's a disaster. So if we think that we found a solution in our papers, research on how you can actually implement it in, in, in reality and constantly over time, uh, uh, give me three good papers, I'll take them tomorrow. Thanks then for the, for the feedback. And yeah, I think we share uh, in the broader community frustration about you know, the importance of, and that's why we, Really appreciate your uh, uh, your presentation and and the book and the you know also introducing people economists to uh, real places, real innovation, real agents. You know that 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 thing called organization, real uh, economists. So thanks so much. I don't see any other question. Uh, very generous of you to spend uh, so much time with us, and thanks for addressing all the question. Thanks everyone. Um, next week we have another. Uh, event with Leonardo Burlamacqui. We'll go back to a bit of uh, Schumpeter and uh, new ways of reading Schumpeter as well. So I invite you all to uh, uh, join us. And uh, until then, thanks. Thanks, everyone.